Hello and welcome back. We have been talking about the role of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, the third part of the Trinity, but equally as important. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about um, living a life with the Holy Spirit in these temple, these bodies, the Holy Spirit of God lives within us when we are Christ. And um, if you have not been part of this podcast series, this is number four, and we're actually going to do number four and five together, covering the last two praise letters in this subject. But you can go back and watch these as well. And you can also read them, read the praise letters at DallasHome.com. So check those out. Yeah. Well, in the last one, we were talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a highly controversial doctrinal issue. There are those that uh, the doctrinal statement is the initial physical evidence of the infilling or baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And you know, we discussed how that's problematic to mm -hmm. support fully scripturally because there are certainly references to those who are filled with the Spirit, uh, Stephen, Zacharias, Elizabeth, to name three, and there's no mention of speaking in tongues. Jesus' instructions concerning the day of Pentecost was that you'll receive power, not receive yeah. tongues. Now they spoke in other tongues. And there were those who spoke in other tongues. I believe in the gift of tongues. I believe, you know, like my grandpa used to say, it's in the Bible. If yeah. you discussed anything with him, well, what about that? It's a great answer. It's in the Bible. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Now to understand the biblical perspective, that's another thing. But we talked about that and we talked even, in fact, I found it after we were done because we kind of concluded talking about from uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' book, uh, Joy Unspeakable, how he references especially some of the great reformers, mm -hmm. uh, Luther and Calvin and Spurgeon and Edwards, and I think Whitfield was in there and some others, who all testified in their, either their journals or the writings of the, of an experience, sometimes experiences. We were talking uh, off camera about Moody, who literally was despondent. He was discouraged. He was just almost, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think he was in New York and suddenly had this encounter with the Holy Spirit that he referenced later on. And that really was the beginning yeah. of his ministry. It was like joy unspeakable. It was like heaven coming down. It was just enraptured in this. Mm -hmm. If that's not a baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there was no reference to any accompanying gift or manifestation. Uh, so there are some who doctrinally would then be dismissive of that. They would say, oh, well, that wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he didn't speak in tongues. I, I just think that would be real unfortunate to come to that conclusion. I, I ran across a quote by John Kelvin, the reformer of reformists, uh, and I love this. He, he says, uh, uh, O my soul, thou art ready to burst within me. O my heart, thou art swelled with grief. The hot tide of my emotion would well nigh overflood the channels of my veins. I long to speak, but the very desire chains my tongue. I wish to pray, but the fervency of my feelings curbs my language. There is a groaning within that cannot be uttered. Do you know who can utter that groaning? Who can understand it? Who can put it into heavenly language and utter it in a celestial tongue so that Christ can hear it? Oh yes, it is God, the Holy Spirit. He advocates our cause with Christ and then Christ advocates it with his Father. He is the advocate who makes the intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Charles mm -hmm. Haddon Spurgeon. <laughs> yeah. I just love that because there are those who, yeah. uh, especially... Uh, you know, what I call hardcore Calvinists who just, they just, oh, they don't want to go anywhere near such things as uh, certain gifts of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues or praying in tongues or, you know, certain of the manifestation gifts. And here's their hero. Yeah. I mean, uh, kind of sounds like he leans a little bit to that yeah. side, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's just, it, it's always good. That's not scripture. That's just experience. That's a testimony. But I think it is worth uh, worth paying attention to. Yeah. This was a great line uh, from the August 2020 praise letter. Let's keep in mind that when a person is converted, they are indwelt in full by the Holy Spirit. However, in the same way that a person can be fully saved but not continue in spiritual growth, is it not possible for a Christian to be indwelt fully by the Spirit but not be living a Spirit-filled life as defined in Ephesians 5.18? So Ephesians 5.18 says, be being continually right. filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's how uh, I love uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem uh, in, in breaking down the Greek. He said, if we were to interpret this really, really properly in our English verbiage, it would say, be being continually yeah. filled with the Holy Spirit. No, yeah. It's like there's this almost overemphasis. Uh, it's being careful, the Holy Spirit is being careful not to, in saying this, 
be filled as though you're not filled. So this is something you need. You're empty. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, it was clearly understood. It was assumed. It was pre-assumed. Oh, you have the Holy Spirit. He's writing to believers mm -hmm. from everything he's teaching biblically. Uh, you know, as we've said before, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. So he's writing to spirit-filled, true spirit-filled Christians, but he's telling them, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean then? It means make sure that you're being continually, always filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, that there's this, this flow in and through us. It's not a one-time thing, right. but a continue, And that has to do with sanctification. I love mm -hmm. what Oswald Chambers says. Uh, he works out that, uh, we work out that which he has worked in. Mm -hmm. He works within us, uh, the marvelous gift of sanctification. But then it's this ongoing process, and some doctrinally disagree with that. There are denominations that believe that sanctification is a separate and unique second act of grace, they would call it, uh, as we always say in a, in a altar call situation. You would say, now those who need to be saved, come to the front, we'll pray with you. Now those who need to be sanctified, hmm. and uh, okay, I want to be sanctified, they get, they get prayed for there, now you're sanctified. That becomes problematic then the first time you sin or have a sinful thought, right. which Scripture teaches us clearly that we're, uh, you know, it doesn't say, uh, you know, I mean, we're going to have failure. Right. <laughs> we're, going to, right. we're going to sin. We know that, uh, hence, we have an advocate. If we weren't going to sin, we wouldn't need an advocate. Right. So That's the new mercies every morning. <laughs> it, well, exactly. It's a, a whole big part of it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's clear. It's important to understand that that verse is not referring to, okay, an impartation subsequent to salvation. This is being written to people that are saved, thus have the Holy Spirit within them, but encouragement to make sure you are continually always being, living in that fullness of the Holy Spirit. And, that, and that's something we, we need to remember. You know, as we've talked about it, boy, if God is... If the Holy Spirit is God, and God is the Holy Spirit, He's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, so we have fully God dwelling within us, what does that look like? What does that call us to? What does that demand of us? Yes. What is our response to that? That's the whole purpose of talking about this, mm -hmm. really, not to just have some kind of doctrinal discussion about it. We could go on forever and ever, never mm -hmm. cover everything, but the, the, the basic principles are that the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us. That's God within us by His Spirit, and now we're being told, make sure that's continually filling you up, yeah. that you are living. That's what a spirit-filled life looks like. Spirit-filled life isn't about running around doing miracles or speaking in tongues. Right. It's being continually indwelt. And the reality of that, I always say our, our lives ought to display the reality of a risen Christ alive within us by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's spirit-filled living. So, which kind of leads to our next, uh, you know, wading into here. Well, and one more thing real quick. Yeah. Spirit-filled living means living out the fruits of the Spirit. But that's the fruit. Right. That, that is what's seen. And um, Paul says in Colossians 1, 8, I think, that since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, right. patience, and then above all, clothe yourselves with love. And, right. and I think those are the things, I mean, we can easily get wrapped up in, are they signs and wonders or are there miracles happening or th yeah. it's the love joy peace patience right. tender-hearted mercy kindness humility well, that speaks and, and that prioritizes that clearly for those who are more gift oriented and there certainly are people they're all about the power of the gifts mm -hmm. paul clearly says if i can do all these things yeah, speak with the love. tongues of uh, you know angels mm -hmm. i'm just a bunch of noise mm -hmm. if i don't number one first of all possess the fruit of the spirit right. so the fruit trumps if you will yep. <laughs> the gifts yep. the gifts without the fruit are just a bunch of noise is what he's saying yep. so yeah proper perspective good point point. Uh, and you know i always say if you're going to describe jesus because our goal as christians is to be christ-like we're supposed yep. to be literally flesh and blood representatives of who jesus is mm -hmm. how would you define jesus then how who is he what is he like well yeah. you don't go to tongues and prophecy. Now he was, certainly all these things flowed from him, but he was peace, joy, love, mm -hmm. goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, patience, self-control. Yeah. That defines completely who he is, what he was like, how we, he would have been perceived, what you would have felt like in his presence. You know, yeah. it's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, good point. It's so important because yeah. 
you do have those that just well, gifts, 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 power, power, power. You know, I always say too, uh, you can go to a Christian bookstore, you can find a lot of material on, quote, the resurrected life, the life of power, resurrection power. It's not a bad term. It's not a wrong term. But I always like to point out, you can't have a resurrection until, first of all, you have a death. Yeah. True Christianity, first and foremost, is a death. We die to ourselves, crucified with Christ. It's no longer be, it's Christ who lives within me. That's where it starts. Then these other things flow out of that. That's right. Yeah. Well, and I'm studying Revelation right now, and I was just... Good luck with that. Ooh, I know. Hey, <laughs> it's the only book of the Bible that says you'll be blessed if you read it and listen to it. So <laughs> I'm reading and listening. Bless me, Lord. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but I was just awed by... Um, it was in chapter 13 about the Antichrist and the Antichrist and the false prophet. And he's going to do some pretty amazing signs and wonders. And right. the commentary I was listening to just, he said, you know what? When we run after signs and wonders, when we're looking for specific aspects of how God works or what he does or what we want to see, that's really scary. And it can get really scary. And, and Jesus and warns against it in Scripture. Absolutely. All kinds of An warnings. evil generation seeks after a sign. Yep. He even points out if a raise someone from the dead you still wouldn't believe so the signs are yep. not should not be the uh, the defining moment yep no nope. and his point was we need to be seeking truth and love yep. because those are signs of christ yep. in his word yep. so well let's explore a little bit in these closing moments as yes. they always say and with this i close um <laughs> seven more minutes so there are those in fact i have friends dear friends uh qualified competent scholars men of god who fall in the cessationist camp. Mm -hmm. They cessationist, C-E-S-S-A-T-I-O-N-S-T-I-O-N-I-S-T, -S -S mm -hmm. cessationist, <laughs> which means ceasing, having ceased. Mm -hmm. I, I was speaking on this one time <laughs> about cessationism, and a young lady came up to me afterwards and said, I'm so glad you talk about them sensationalists, because <laughs> I'm glad you're not a sensationalist. <laughs> and I just thought, well, thank you, I'm glad I'm not yes. too. You know, you kind of missed the point, and that was okay. But... So there is a, a broad school of thought that certain, and, and even the cessationist group falls into a couple different camps. There are those cessationists who believe that all of the, what we would call the manifestation or miraculous gifts listed uh, by Paul, that those don't operate anymore. Then there's another group that say, well, some of those gifts still operate, but the ones that he mentions in uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, well, if he mentions it, uh, those don't work anymore. So let, let's go to 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. 13, and we won't go through the whole chapter. We'll start with, uh, and, and th there is where he's speaking about love. Of course, we call it the love chapter. Starting with verse 8, it says, And love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I have also been fully known. And then, But now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the grace of these is love. So the cessationist camp makes the case, and I would say most who don't believe in either any or all of those gifts mentioned or some not mentioned specifically there, we'll just call them the manifestation gifts, which scripture doesn't really categorize them like that, but there mm -hmm. certainly is a place where certain gifts are articulated. So scholars later on said, well, let's call them manifestation gifts as opposed to ministerial gifts or whatever. It's fine. So cessationists will say that either some or all of those gifts don't operate anymore. And their stance, their biblical stance is that verse, when the perfect comes, yeah. They define that as the perfect means the completion of Scripture or the canonization of Scripture. So their argument is Scripture has been completed. John finished writing in about 80, 90 to 95. And when that was completed, then uh, the perfect, the word, the Scriptures, the canon is, is finished. So therefore, the, that's... The, the problem with that is I'm not aware of, and I've read this book through, certainly not as many times as some, but many, many times through the years. I'm not aware of any place else in Scripture that the term the perfect refers to the Scriptures or the Word of God. I am aware, three references in Hebrews I can think of, where the perfect or the perfect one references Jesus, clearly. I think scholarship falls much more forcefully on the side of 
referencing that to and having been understood by the original readers as the return of Christ, when Christ comes, when the perfect one comes back, when the culmination of all things happens, certainly there will be no more need for these gifts. Yeah. The other school of thought, is, and I would say it's a lesser school of thought, but I have, I've heard there are those who say, usually more in the hardcore reform camp, well, but historically, when you study church history, biblical, or, or church history, uh, post-biblical, you know, canonization times, that these uh, gifts kind of taper off, that as the word becomes more prominent, they've got the manuscripts. That That's always a bit of a problem for me because here you have people that everything, uh, they'll say, I preach the word, teach the word, pray the word, sing the word, 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 word. And I, again, you can't overemphasize ever the importance of the word of God. But it's interesting to me that this same camp who is so word-based suddenly departs from the word and they go to the subjective experience of history. Mm -hmm. And history, at best, is a subjective experience. It is the account of people as they saw it and wrote it, even in yeah. Scripture. Yeah. And we don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but I just think if it comes to mind, uh, the story of the Gadarene demoniac. One gospel account, it's two men. One, another gospel account, it's one man. That's the problem. And I say problem. We know it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's one of those questions I'll ask, hopefully, maybe when I get to heaven, maybe it won't matter. How did you see two guys and you saw one guy? How does yeah. the scripture say one and two here? But that's the subjective experience of historical account. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to, something as important as the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, you're going to write some of that off because, well, a historian or the accounts back in the first or second century seem to indicate that's a departure from scripture. The best commentary on scripture is scripture. Right. So show me scripturally, show me biblically, concrete where it says, oh, these gifts stop. Now, yeah. the bigger problem, I think, is if, if you, for example, if you, and I think the larger school of thought uh, amongst the cessationists is in the 10th verse, but when the perfect comes, they interpret that as that means the, the scripture. Now, Paul wrote this in about A.D. 40 to 45, I think it was. I may be off on my math there. From the time he wrote this until the time John finished writing would have been basically 35 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Grudem points out, and I actually thought of this myself before I read Dr. Grudem. Like, you love it when you read someone that you respect and a lot smarter than I am and go, hey, I thought the same thing. So it would be like saying... So these gifts are only good for 35 or 40 right. years. Right, got a shelf life. The perfect has come, they ended. So it's just this, I mean, something as monumental as the Spirit of God coming to dwell within, empower the church. Uh, they would have clearly understood this all to be just normal, mm -hmm. everyday behavior in the realm of the church, the body of Christ, that the Spirit works in these ways, but only for 35 or 40 years yeah. that he's out here. <laughs> I mean, it, it just, it falls yeah. apart. And, and where it falls apart specifically is, because when the perfect comes, okay, that's assuming when the word is finished or we have the scriptures, the partial, which is referring back to the gifts that he mentions, will be done away with. Now, if you take out, and, I, and I, I'm not saying take out of scripture, but verse 12 refers to verse 10. Verse 11, when it says, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child. He's just making the case for understanding from a mature position. You know, when I was a child, this is how I thought. Mm -hmm. But... If the perfect in verse 10 is the word of God, and okay, the perfect has come, so now these gifts are done away with, the problem is, it says, for now, in the 12th verse, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Okay, what is right. the then referring to? The then refers directly to when, mm -hmm. in verse 10. When the perfect comes, if you were to put this together as a sentence, which it is, he's got a little extra thought in there about when he was a child, but it would say, it would read like this. So when the word is completed, if the perfect is the word, when the word is completed, then I will see him face to face yeah. and I will yeah. know as I am fully known. So. so then you have to conclude, okay, if you believe that the word is the perfect, referring to that, and that has come, that has been completed, well then, in verse 12, then we now see him face to face and right. we know as we're fully... Uh, right. Are we there? Yeah. I mean... Would anyone testify, yes, I now see him face to face. That's what's happening. And yeah. this, this culmination has, I mean, talk about heresy. Yeah. So it, 
within the within the space of three verses there to me and to many others and not to some, it just all falls apart. Mm-hmm. And then there are those, like I said, who, well, no, we don't think that's the case. The case is more in church history. As scripture became more prominent, these things were not as necessary. But there yeah, again, I go, but, experiences. okay, but that's the, that's mm-hmm. the subjective experience of history that mm-hmm. you're suddenly departing from scripture. You're not going to let scripture be the commentary on scripture. You let a historian, mm-hmm. someone say, well, this seems to be what was going on back then as right. I remember it. Right. It's just a, it's a it's kind of a weak slip. and I think a fr- frightening case. Mm-hmm. So all that to say, the Holy Spirit is alive and well within us. Yes. And anything and everything that he ever did within the New Testament Christian, he should be interested in doing in and through us. Mm-hmm. I just don't, I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I don't see anything biblically that would indicate otherwise. Well, no, but not not now, not through me, not in that way. But again, so many have backed off because we've seen misrepresentations. We've seen people that have taken the minor, major, made it a major. Ooh, speaking in tongues, you know, that. Mm-hmm. Let, let's put that right to the front. I mean, you don't even have the Holy Spirit unless you have spoken in a tongue. Yeah. Scripture nowhere says that. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully this at least gives some food for thought to have discussions. Mm-hmm. And more than anything else, and this is what happened to me, when I... Uh, when I left David Wilkerson, I was been with him for ten and a half years. Wonderful man of God, great relationship, very much a father son relationship. But when I left him to go out on my own in ministry, I realized, oh, I need to know the word for myself. I need to have a word from the Lord. I need to be able to. I can't just depend on this man of God. Mm-hmm. I got to know what I believe and why I believe it. So I began to really search the scriptures, and in some of these doctrinal areas that I had grown up just to believe, well, this is how it is because yeah. that's how they told me it was. I couldn't make the biblical case the same yeah. way I'd been taught. And that's what I encourage you to do. Anything yes. we're saying here, and I'm sure there are some of you, oh, poor Dallas and his <laughs> dear, lovely daughter, they're just, oh, I can't believe they even said that. They're so wrong. I'm absolutely fine with that if you feel that and think that. But make sure that you're able to stand yeah. on the authority, the integrity, and the yes. sufficiency of this word to know what you believe, articulate it, know why you believe that. And, uh, I, you know, the Holy Spirit, again, is our teacher. He'll be happy to teach you all yep, of this. He's right. still teaching me. I haven't got it all figured out by a long shot. Yep. Yes. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you.